Bernhard is here. If you want to unmute him to say hi. We are we are live. Oh. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second lecture of Deep Learning of the Machine Learning Summer School 2020. Uh, Joshua, the stage is yours. All right. Um, just give me a second to uh, share my screen. Um, did it work? No, we're not seeing the shared screen yet. Mm. Okay. Uh, Zoom seems to be stuck in a weird place. How's that? Perfect, yeah. Okay. So uh, there was one topic that I wanted to do yesterday, but I didn't have time. Um, a very, very quick uh, few words about generative models, because it's something I've worked a lot on, but, um, and, and I've worked on many kinds of generative models, but I'm just gonna say a few words about GANs because they've been so, so successful and so popular. Um, so the, the, the thing I want to mention uh, first is how we got to GANs in the first place as a, as a way to think about uh, generative models. And of course, there are many interesting angles to discuss GANs, but the, the one that I, I had been uh, really pushing for a few years is the idea that instead of thinking of um, generative models, or uh, density estimation and the usual way of like, uh, like putting an energy function or density somewhere, um, which we know is hard. Uh, I thought, well, we, we have these neural nets that do a great job at classification. Can we, can we use a classifier to learn a density? And one of the motivations for this is uh, that for the kind of distributions we care about, like that of images, the uh, images, texts, a lot of natural distributions, the probability mass is concentrated. What does that mean is it means that you, you, you have a usually lower dimensional manifold where the uh, objects in the distribution, the, the samples concentrate and uh, the probability would be high in those regions. And then it would be close to zero almost everywhere else, uh, barring for a little bit of, you know, allowing for noise and stuff. So there's a bit of thickness to these manifolds. And so if that's the case, then really the main job of learning a uh, complicated distribution like that of images is a classification problem where you would like to separate the, uh, you know, inside the region where the probability is high from the outside. Uh, so uh, we were not the only ones thinking about this. And in particular, uh, I think the main uh, uh, conceptual uh, ancestor of this is the many years of work by um, Apple Ivarinen and, um, and his collaborators, uh, Gutman, um, um, Maybe some of you have heard about uh, in particular the noise contrastive estimation approach. Um, so he, he had been also thinking about this uh, much earlier and uh, had come up with pretty interesting approaches. Um, so, so, so one of the motivations for using a classifier is not just that, okay, it's easier to train the classifier, but what, why is it easier? Um, one problem with things like log likelihood 
is uh, you pay a crazy price for uh, some mistakes, right? So for example, if my if I think about this in support classifier problem, um, if if there's one example where I make a classification error, I'll pay one out of n, where n is the number of examples, right? One one classification error. But um, if I'm doing density estimation uh, and I use log like you as a, as a criterion, then I'm going to pay a uh, potentially infinite price for this one place where I said the density should be very small, close to zero. And, um, and my classifier or my density estimator put a um, kind of uh, a false negative. Um, so, so this this actually biases the the way that um, models trained by log likelihood behave, and one of the consequences of this is that uh, log likelihood based models, in other words, trained or or validated or model selected to be good in terms of log likelihood, uh, they tend to be extremely conservative. So, what does that mean? It means they they tend to put probability mass a little bit everywhere just to make sure that they will avoid putting uh, a, uh, a low probability to a place where there might be a data point, either in the training set or the validation set if you're doing model selection. And so there's, there's a, as a consequence, the, those kinds of density estimators, they systematically are biased towards a smoother distribution, right? So they take the, I mean, you, you would expect that you take the empirical distribution, you smooth it out in some way, right? Because you want to put probability mass in other places than the, than the training data. But but the log likelihood models, they overdo it. They the it, it's also a consequence of uh, minimizing the KL divergence if you if you look at it. Uh, but basically, there's too much of a price being paid for not putting probability mass in a place where there might be an example, and so you end up with uh, spreading probability mass now. Spreading probability mass in 1D or 2D is no big deal. The problem is in high dimensions, because in high dimensions, in order to spread probability mass, you have to basically, uh, you, you're going to cover a lot of volume. And that means you're going to put low probability, uh, low but significant probability in a lot of places. And that means in the places where you should put high probability, which is where the, around where the data really is, you're typically going to underestimate the probability, right? So there's this bias that's built in maximum likelihood, um, which if you go for an objective function, which is closer to a classifier, you kind of avoid. So that just was a little bit of motivation. Um, and then, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the GAN itself is one of many ways you could go and run with uh, these motivations. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of exciting aspects of it. Um, very quickly, we realized that it was not a usual uh, uh, training objective because we have these two learners and they each have their own objective. And so uh, we tried to frame it in terms of a game theoretical setup uh, but actually the version that worked well didn't have a single min-max objective. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, it, it made the analysis, uh, we can do the analysis for, for the, the, the case that works. And so we did the analysis for the min-max version, um, but it still provides a lot of insight. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but um, there's so much literature that's being written on this. Um, and, and another historical anecdote I want to mention is uh, maybe more from a sociological point of view. So in 2014, our paper was accepted at NeurIPS and, uh, and, and, and we, we worked really hard before the deadline to get what we thought could be good results. And, it was so hard to make the GANs work. I mean, as many people have found that uh, after the deadline, we thought, okay, so this is a cool idea, but it just doesn't work. Like it's so hard to make it converge and so on. 
so we kind of dropped it. <laughs> um, but other people picked up our paper and uh, played with it and played with the architecture, uh, played with the, the way it was trained and then managed to get amazing uh, images, much better than the ones we had obtained. And so that's how GANs really uh, survived and, and became something important. Uh, so this, the, the, the lesson to this, there are many lessons to this. So one of them is um, something really good might look like it doesn't work, but it needs a bit more work in order to uh, get it to really succeed. Um, and the other thing is, well, uh, we're not uh, living in our own little bubble. Fortunately, there are other scientists who might see things slightly differently. And, and um, it's super important to have that diversity of views so that uh, we can make progress and build on top of each other's work. Yeah, so uh, the, the one on the top is interesting to see the very quick progress in a matter of about four years from our early face generation in 2014 to gradually incredible, real, incredibly realistic uh, images. And of course, once you have a good generator, you can use it to do conditional generation and all kinds of cool stuff and style transfer and image to image and I mean, it, it unlocked doors. Oh, I want to mention this as one recent application we've worked on. Um, so this uh, project um, aims at generating images to help people better understand in a visceral way what climate change could mean. And uh, one of the things, so there, there's actually studies showing that people better internalize uh, ideas if the information can be presented visually. Um, so you might have a scientific fact, but somehow your uh, intuitive mind, uh, your unconscious uh, kind of ignores it, um, uh, especially if it involves making some, some short-term sacrifices like, like climate change forces us to do. And, um, and so there are a number of people have tried to think about how we could carry the information beyond the facts and the formulas and the figures that you find in papers. How do we make people realize what it really means uh, to have changes in climate? And in Quebec, we, we've had in the last few years, uh, record numbers of, uh, of uh, uh, floods uh, in places where it was supposed to be one in a thousand years, it happened like once every two years in the last four years, something. Um, so we thought, okay, let's do floods. Um, what, what does that mean? So we, we can train a, a GAN related architecture to take as input the image of your house and turn it into a flooded house. That's, that's the idea. Now, what makes it hard is we normally don't have uh, input output pairs. <laughs> like we don't we don't really have that data, so um, so it, it looks a little bit like uh, what uh, uh, people have tried to do in style transfer and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details of this, but it, it, we ended up building a fairly complicated uh, architecture. Uh, we already have some uh, papers uh, out, and, and we're writing longer technical descriptions of our work. Okay, now let me get to the meat of uh, this uh, today's lecture, uh, which is really about system two deep learning, how we can extend deep learning to not just capture the intuitive stuff uh, that it's good at right now with, with perception and, and low level um, uh, control and, and, and game playing and stuff like that, but, but also the kind of processing that humans are really good at, but require their conscious attention and awareness. Um, the uh, building block for this, uh, as I'm going to hammer, I think at least as a starting point is the uh, kind of trainable uh, attention mechanism. Uh, we, stumbled on this uh, around 2014 um, 
uh, following up on the quite nice work from uh, Alex Graves uh, the year before for handwriting. Uh, and we added a few, uh, a little twist of making the attention kind of conditional uh, on context. Uh, and we uh, were experimenting with uh, sequence to sequence recurrent nets for machine translation. And we discovered that by making the output recurrent net uh, able to choose where it wanted to focus its attention. Like in other words, which part of the input it wants to look at. I mean, it can look at a summary of the whole input sequence, uh, because remember a recurrent net produces a summary of uh, whatever sequence you give it. But in the summary, you kind of lose a lot of detail. Uh, and so if the output recurrent net, which is trying to produce the French sentence from the input English say, um, when it's producing the word uh, economic can really focus on the English word economic, uh, it's gonna make it really easier, right? I mean, to first order machine translation is like word to word translation. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a gross picture of it, but, but really um, you, there is this notion that uh, there is context, which gives you sort of a lot of um, rich information, but then there is like precise meaning. Like uh, a good example of that of this is if I have a number in the input sentence, like 26, well, you want to make sure when translate that it doesn't end up like 35, right? It, it really has to be 26. So you want to pay attention to those details. And so uh, uh, you want a mechanism in the neural net that allows you to focus attention on specific elements of the input. And now notice the word I use, element. So instead of seeing the input as a sequence, we can start seeing it as a set of elements. Of course, they, they come with some order and we can represent that order in some way. And transformers have added this uh, very nice notion that we can encode the order by, by adding an attribute to the each of the elements, which is sort of a, a code for their position. Um, that makes it easy to compare relative positions. Um, but that, that notion of um, uh, weighing the inputs with attention weights, uh, that sum to one over a set of elements and then taking a weighted sum of uh, these uh, vector values as input for the next piece of computation you care about. That's the heart of uh, the attention mechanism. And uh, what immediately comes up is that for each object, you need to compute two quantities. One that is used to compute the attention weight, and that's what we call the key. And one that is used to compute the value that is sent to the next level. So uh, both are vectors. And the key um, is going to be uh, matched in some way with a query that comes from the, the top, uh, usually at least in, in, in that machine translation setup. And so uh, the, the, the guy on top is looking for something um, and, and it's gonna pick the inputs that somehow match this and it's gonna take the value vectors from those inputs and send it up. Um, now it's going to do all of this in a soft way, like with uh, not a hard selection, but a soft selection so that you can just back prop through the whole thing and learn uh, how you could have done your attention better for next time. Yeah, so uh, very quickly, um, Google incorporated the attention mechanism in their machine, neural machine translation. So they were also working on sequence to sequence at the same time as we were and uh, they scaled it up in a way that we couldn't. And that led to pretty amazing quality of translation. So there was a big jump in quality of uh, uh, Google Translate in terms of human evaluation, um, bridging the gap, uh, at least half of the gap between the, the, the state of the art of those days, which was based on, based on n-grams and uh, humans. Um, at about the same time, it's really interesting that, you know, people uh, in other groups were thinking about very similar uh, computational mechanism, 
for memory access. So again, using uh, uh, an attention mechanism, using a key and a query. So now think of it like the key is sort of the address part of the content of a memory. And the memory has a, has a address part, which is a, a vector, a key vector. And uh, the uh, content is gonna be a value vector. And then the, some controller uh, produces a query in order to select softly one of the addresses or, or sometimes with a hard selection. Um, and then that is gonna be read in for the next piece of computation. Now, the way to think about these uh, attention mechanisms, um, like, like in, in the case of uh, the, the translation or in the case of memory is really what we're doing is we're extending the state, right? So if we think of in terms of recurrent nets, uh, we're, instead of thinking of the state of the recurrent net as the, you know, the last summary, the last hidden uh, state, the state is now the whole sequence of states. It's now you know everything in your memory. So so now you have a huge state. It's kind of a non-parametric state, right? So one way to think about it is, whereas RNNs are parametric, and they compress information from the past into a fixed size vector. When you use a sort of self-attention, where you're allowed to look in the past sequence at everything you've done in the past, which is now a form of memory you basically have an unbounded memory um, and it become a non-parametric system. Not, not in the sense of the way that we represent parameters, but in the sense that we re represent state information. So the state is non-parametric. And why is that useful? Well, it breaks the problem of long-term dependencies, which I've talked about yesterday, which plagues normal recurrent net. So in a normal recurrent net, because you have to compress information into this fixed size vector, you have to throw away information, you have to lose information. And that throwing away information is basically what gives rise to the vanishing gradient, right? Because you have a many to one mapping and many to one mapping means eigenvalues less than one. And that means when you multiply all these Jacobians, you, you, you converge to zero. So if instead you allow yourself to store everything that you observe, which by the way, your brain is doing to some extent, your brain has enough memory to store your whole life as a video. Uh, we don't seem to do it, but some people seem to have like really a lot of, uh, we only store high level stuff, by the way, that's another interesting thing. We don't store the pixels, uh, but we store a huge amount of stuff and, or we, and we could store more if you just count the, capacity in the synapses in the brain. So, and, and memory is cheap, right? Like in computers today, memory is the cheapest thing. Like why should we limit ourselves to having like a thousand numbers to store the past? It's crazy, right? Um, uh, once you allow yourself to do that, you can, you can create sort of skip connections across time. And uh, that allows to basically bypass the, the problem of uh, vanishing gradients. I could go into more details of this and, and we have a, a NURP submission on this uh, following up on the earlier NIPS 2018 um, uh, self-attentive backtracking paper, Rosemary K et al. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there's really fundamental issues here about how attention opens up something about memory that can by, allow us to bypass the problem of vanishing gradients. Uh, if you want to learn more, we have papers. Okay. Um, the transformers brought um, another uh, trick. So in addition to uh, the, this position encoding, uh, multiple heads, right? So, uh, instead of evaluating each element uh, based on a single query, you can have multiple queries. And then for each query, you're gonna produce a different weighted value. So one way to think about this is like, what we're computing on top is a function, right? Now, and that function is gonna take an argument and what the attention does is select from the set of the previous layer, 
a set of elements from a fuse, it selects one of the elements, all right? One of the value vectors for, uh, from one of the elements. Um, but usually when you compute a function, the function needs to have more than one argument, right? Typically you'd like to have, I don't know, two, three, four arguments. Many interesting functions have more than one argument. In the transformer, uh, you also have like an automatic argument, which is the, the value of the current element that, uh, that we're focusing on. But, but, but the general thing is you'd like to have multiple arguments. And so the idea is very simple. You just use a different attention uh, query and attention, uh, what we call attention heads. Each computes a different uh, weighted sum of uh, value vectors. And so now you can, you can take multiple arguments, concatenate them as input for whatever the next computation is gonna be. Um, yeah, uh, there are also computational advantages uh, in the transformers in terms of parallelization compared to RNN, compared to RNN, uh, because you can do each layer all in parallel, right? You don't, you, in an RNN, information flows from the past to the future, uh, and you have to wait for each step to be done. So the sequential aspect of RNNs makes it hard to, uh, to uh, take advantage of, um, parallelism, but the, with transformers now, you still have a sequential aspect, but it's layer, each layer has to be done after the next. Um, so you, you get, you, you gain in, in uh, parallelization. Um, okay. Yeah, I said all these things already. Oh yeah, this interesting uh, neuroscience observation. Uh, how the, it looks like the brain is considering attention like if it was an internal muscle, right? So, so normally your brain controls your muscles and uh, the action space of your brain is like controlling all those muscles. But if you think about attention, it, it is a sort of internal action. It, it controls the flow of computation in the brain. And we've been thinking about things like this for many years. So I, I've, I've uh, proposed uh, uh, like seven years ago or something, something called conditional computation where uh, you, you have a neural net, but depending on the input, you, you have some pieces of it that control which part of the neural net is gonna be selected. So, so, and we used RL to decide what were these internal actions. So actually this, these were early forms of attention mechanisms that gate uh, what part of the neural net should be executed. Um, so, so the brain seems to manage attention in a way that the same kind of uh, neural circuits that are used to uh, manage uh, external actions. And uh, part of that is we have an internal control model of like, if I move this muscle, what's gonna be the consequence? Your brain kind of is able to predict uh, what would be the consequence of an action before you do the action. That's how you kind of figure out what to do. Uh, it's not, you're not conscious of that, but it's happening. Um, and it looks like the brain has a similar mechanism to kind of predict what would be the consequence of focusing your attention in a particular place versus another place. So it can use that to guide how to attend. All right, now, why, why would we care about this attention thing? I mean, besides the fact that it works really well for NLP and uh, that humans seem to use it. I think there's a fundamental machine learning motivation for this, um, which, uh, which addresses a critique of uh, neural nets that has been raised, for example, by Lake et al. Um, that we would like to have machines and, and current like standard neural nets don't do that. We'd, we'd like to have a machine that can dynamically recombine existing concepts, just like in the picture here. Um, where the, you can interpret the, the, the sort of new fancy vehicle by uh, drawing from your memory or the pictures here, uh, vehicles you already know. Um, and uh, this 
this is very, very common in linguistics. Like we can recombine words or phrases whose meaning we know in uh, new ways. And it's very clear what the resulting meaning of the combination is, is gonna be. We have some, uh, some uh, way to do that. And what's really exciting about this uh, ability for systematic generalization or systematicity is that we are able to do this sort of recombination even when the result, like in, in the VACO example, uh, has essentially zero probability under the training distribution. It doesn't look like anything you've seen. Uh, as an example, we, we can read a science fiction plot, right? That is impossible, but we can understand the story and we can guess the, the end of the story from the beginning of the story or something. So uh, we actually make sense of these science fiction scenarios. Or we can move to a different country where the traffic laws are different. Uh, maybe you drive on the left versus the right or something. And uh, we manage to adapt very quickly to, to such changes in distribution. When we are confronted with such situations though, usually we need to pay attention. Like we can't do it in automatic mode. So it looks like this ability to generalize out of distribution is tied to conscious processing and attention. Like somebody talks to you while you're on your first day in driving in the UK, uh, when you were driving, driving in North America or something, you don't want the person on the right to talk to you, right? Um, and, and yeah, and as I said, there's a number of papers, including experimental studies from, from uh, our group um, showing that it's, it's hard to get this uh, systematic generalization from uh, neural nets if you train them in the usual way based on a training distribution and a test distribution, which is from the same distribution as the training distribution. I mean, a training, sorry, a test set, which is from the same distribution as the training set. Um, that doesn't work to select the kind of architectures which really can generalize out of distribution. Um, so, so this issue of uh, generalizing out of distribution, I think is one of the hottest areas of machine learning these days. So for many decades, we have focused both our theory and our thinking about algorithms on uh, normal generalization, where we assume that the test data is gonna come from the same distribution as the training data. But, uh, and all our theory is based on this. But, but really when you build systems in the real world, like companies do that, or, you're facing a different situation where the tool you're building is gonna be used in somewhat different setting as your training distribution because the world changes, because maybe you've trained you know, from data from one country and it's gonna be used in a different country and all kinds of reasons like this. So I think we can learn a lot from how humans manage to deal with that challenge and by the way, not just humans, but it looks like mammals and birds seem to have also some form of this. Um, and uh, if we take the inspiration from linguistics, like how do we manage to do it uh, on the language side? Uh, a big aspect of it is our ability to reuse uh, pieces of knowledge in new ways. Pieces of knowledge here being words and their meaning. So, so now it's, it's time for me to tell you about system one and system two, um, at least the way that I use those words. Uh, very broadly, uh, psychologists and neuroscientists have been uh, thinking about different types of processing in your brain and tasks, which seem to call to different uh, abilities uh, so one would be system one and the other would be system two. And um, uh, Dan Kahneman, uh, who had a Nobel Prize for uh, his work, uh, wrote a very nice book, very easy to read on, on that story, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I encourage you to read. Um, so roughly speaking, the system one uh, computation is intuitive, very fast parallel, 
and we don't have conscious access to it. So it's hard to express what we're doing there in words. And it's habitual. In other words, it's the kind of thing we can do repeatedly very well. We're very competent at doing these things so long as we stay in our usual in distribution setting. Um, current deep learning is good at those kinds of tasks that we do with system one, like, like object recognition. System two tasks are very different. It's almost like um, the opposite, right? So uh, it's everything about conscious processing. The way we solve problems using system two is very slow. It's sequential. We go through steps. Like if I ask you to add 34 and 36, you can do it in your head. In fact, if you're used to doing mental calculation, you might even do it with system one. So let me do uh, 331 and uh, 56. Now you really have to think and um, it, it really go through steps in your mind. So this is precisely what we do when we program, right? Uh, algorithms are like this. Planning seems to be in great part uh, uh, requiring system two. It might also require system one, but, and reasoning in general, right? So think of planning as a special form of reasoning. And what, what is reasoning really? Reasoning is about combining pieces of information in a coherent way, either to imagine what could happen or what has happened, what could have happened, uh, to find explanations, to, um, but, but we can do it on the fly and it's sequential and it looks at very few pieces of knowledge at a time. And what's nice about system two is we can talk about it, right? So, uh, the knowledge that we manipulate at that level can be communicated. It's verbalizable knowledge. And it's all happening in your brain and your brain is a big neural net. So we out of find uh, neural net architectures and ways of training that um, allow us to do system two as well as we're currently doing system one. So that's why I call it deep learning 2.0, just to be facetious. And um, Let's, let's look a little bit more at uh, what neuroscientists have found about consciousness and conscious processing. Uh, so, so first of all, um, the study of consciousness is fairly young. For, for most of the 20th century, it was considered a taboo to study consciousness in science. Uh, it was the realm only of uh, philosophers and theologians and stuff like that. Um, but in the last 20 years of the last century, things have changed because we suddenly had access to uh, fMRI imagery of the brain, and it allowed scientists to find that the kind of processing that you do when uh, you do this intuitive system one task uh, translates into different neural patterns, neural activity. Uh, than what you, when you do sort of conscious processing. And so it looked like, you know, consciousness was not just some sort of mysterious energy that flows between our minds and, you know, like some remnant of the soul, but actually had a physical reality that we could study in the brain. And so since then, uh, a number of theories to try to understand well, what is the difference between conscious processing and unconscious processing uh, have uh, arisen? And the one that I like the most, and it's probably the most, uh, the one of, at least one of the two dominant ones, is called the global workspace theory. And um, it, it's uh, Bernie Bars uh, that first published on this. And then a lot of uh, uh, work has been done uh, to connect it even more to the neuroscience by Stan DeHen and the collaborators. And what this, this theory says um, is that there is a kind of uh, bottleneck in the brain that um, through which information um, is exchanged between different parts of the brain, different modules in the brain. So, so 
if the brain is so big that you don't have like a fully connected network, like there's no way uh, you could have that. So somehow you need a way for different parts of the brain to talk to each other. And um, and this this form of processing emerged that is is present in in, in mammals, which um, does it through something that looks like a blackboard or a workspace, a working memory, where uh, selected aspects of the current computation and, and some parts of your brain get to be copied. So now you have a notion of indirection and attention. Um, some elements in the computation that's going on in the brain is gonna win a competition and it's gonna trigger a cascade of uh, um, uh, signals in the brain, very, very loud, that is going to broadcast that information to the whole brain. Right. So, so this is a very different style of processing than what we're used to thinking with uh, classical neural nets, where the the meaning of the signals that are carried through uh, by the neurons is always the same. Here, it depends on what has been selected by you know, what, won, what part of the brain won the competition and what message was sent. So now we have these messages and they have to be exchanged between the different parts and they, they, they have to be somehow encoded in a sort of uh, lingua franca so that the different modules can talk to each other and, 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 and carry those indirect messages. So that's... Uh, that's the, the basis of this theory. Um, the, the stuff that is, has been selected goes into this short-term memory and it heavily conditions both perception and action, mostly action, but, but also perception. If you've done the, the uh, if you look at the video with the hidden gorilla, you will know what I mean. Um, so you, you can not see things based on, on um, what you're expecting, for example, at, at a high level. So there's a very strong top-down influence. And of course, it drives your decisions and actions at every moment of your life. Um, there's there's a, uh, an interesting also uh, view of, um, uh, what, what's going on with, with, you know, why do we need a sort of uh, single point of passage is to force a form of coherence between different parts of the brain. And if you think of your brain as a sort of simulation machine, right, you can imagine stuff. Um, so your brain is running this simulation, but because the knowledge is distributed across the brain, in different parts of it. And the simulation could call upon any of these pieces of knowledge at any time. You need all the parts to coordinate to, to create that simulation. And you want to make sure that they do it in a coherent way. So, I mean, potential explanation for why we need this bottleneck is to create that forced uh, uh, coordination and, um, and yeah, uh, because because we only have this one brain that runs one simulation at a time. Okay, um, so let's go back to the machine learning perspective on this. So so my view of system one and system two from a kind of abstract machine learning perspective is thinking about it from the perspective of inductive biases. It's like if out in the world there are statistical dependencies uh, that our brain is trying to capture. And well, learning is hard and it gets easier if you, if you make the right assumptions, right? This is what machine learning is all about. Priors, inductive biases, every learning algorithm is really bringing an inductive bias, right? Um, but sometimes you have assumptions or priors that could work well for some aspects of the world, but not for other aspects. And it looked, I mean, one interpretation of the system one and system two thing, uh, at least one aspect of it is, uh, it may be that 
there are these priors that work well for verbalizable knowledge, but don't necessarily work well for non-verbalizable knowledge. So if that was true, and the verbalizable knowledge, even though it didn't cover everything in the world, uh, would be useful for something. And then it is indeed very useful. Everything we do with language falls in this category. So that's a lot of stuff. Uh, then it would make sense to have two systems, two types of computations in your brain to uh, uh, be able to exploit the, the aspects of the world that satisfy those priors on one hand, but also have capability to model things that don't satisfy those priors uh, using a different style of processing. So, so that's the way I think about system one and system two. And so if we think of it this way, then uh, from a machine learning uh, theory point of view, what we want to do is clarify what are those inductive biases? Right? If we can understand those biases, then, well, maybe the brain is implementing some of them in a particular way, but we don't have to do it in that way. And you know, it would help us really to guide our search for architectures and algorithms. If we, if we have a more abstract notion of what we're looking for, uh, what those, uh, uh, assumptions are because then you know it, it can tell us the kind of experiment we can do to test theories about human intelligence uh, as well as guide different explorations of uh, architectures and, and algorithms. Um, so here's my initial list of inductive biases which I think are associated with system two. In other words, many of these things don't quite work with current deep learning, don't quite work with uh, intuitive knowledge. Um, all right, so I'm going to first give you a, a quick intro to each of them, and then I'm gonna go through some of them in more details with some of the work we've been doing uh, around them. So the first one is one I wrote about three years ago in a, in a paper called The Consciousness Prior. And it's um, the idea that for those uh, high-level variables, so now I'm gonna call them these high-level variables or semantic variables. Semantic means it's connected to the meaning of things we can verbalize like words and phrases and stuff. Um, so these semantic variables, they have a joint distribution, well, like any variables, um, and that joint distribution is highly constrained in the sense that the corresponding factor graph is sparse. So the factor graph is just a way to represent the graphical model in which we uh, associate each of the statistical dependencies with uh, a, 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 a potential function, like a little parametric entity, which specifies how a set of uh, variables is, is uh, interdependent with uh, each other in that small subset. And sparse here means that those sets of variables which interact um, uh, directly, uh, they're small sets, right? So the, the graph is very sparse. Uh, so I'll come back to that and I'll give you examples to justify why it makes sense. Now, this is a very, uh, this is a, like a declarative uh, constraint. It's, it's about how the joint distribution looks like it, it's not completely clear how to turn that into algorithms that, uh, the do inference, for example, which your brain is doing, but we'll come back to that. Um, another uh, claimed property of these semantic variables is that they have a lot to do with causality. So if, if you look at most sentences, most of the words there, uh, especially the, the content words. They, not, not the ones that deal with the grammar, but the ones that deal with the, the meaning. Um, what do they tell us? They, they, they tell us about agents, like subjects of actions. Like there's a person, an animal, or something that did something. And usually uh, that agent will do something to uh, a controllable object or to another agent or something like this. Right? So, so we have entities which act, which are causing things to happen. And we have entities that are uh, uh, 
going, you know, having the consequences, uh, the effects of these um, uh, interventions. And then, of course, we have words to describe what the what the uh, actions were, or you know, what they might be, or like intentions and things like that. And then how they were modulated, like when, where, and all that stuff. Right? It's all about a particular change in the relationship between variables due to some action, right? I mean, it, I'm not saying language is all about that, but it seems to be a lot about that. And just even grammar, like subject, verb, object, right? Like it's the very basic structure is around this. Um, another, another prior and inductive bias, which I think is amazingly important for out of distribution generalization, um, it's, it says something not just about the joint distribution between the high level semantic variables, but about how these causal interventions due to agents are changing things. How these causal interventions are creating non-stationaries, how they're creating changes in distribution. And what it says is that those changes in distribution can be localized to say one or very few of those semantic variables. And my kind of uh, hand wavy proof of this is if you can describe the change with a single sentence, like he opened the door and blah, 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 then there were some consequences. It was like one agent, one action, bang, intervention. I mean, the consequences of opening the doors were terrible. You know, this is a science fiction movie, don't forget. Uh, all the monsters are coming in and your world is turned upside down. So this, uh, you know, this kind of assumption, it, it highlights the fact that it doesn't have to be true in general, but it seems to be true for all of the things that we like to describe with language. Right, and why is important because it it provides us a very convenient assumption to deal with changes in distribution, as we'll see. Because if the change can be localized to one or like a couple of variables, it's going to be much easier to explain the change, to adapt to the change. Right, very few parameters or variables need to be, uh, you know, doing some sort of inference over in order to figure out. The, that modification, which seems to change the distribution. So we're gonna be able to uh, be more robust to these changes in distribution if we have learned the right space of representation where the changes are localized. Um, another assumption, which I almost like took for granted from the beginning, when I said that the high level variables are semantic variables, is that there's got to be a fairly simple mapping between those high-level semantic variables, which you can think of as uh, the output of uh, uh, an encoder that takes perception, uh, sensory signals, and uh, and outputs these high-level representations, which could still be distributed, but there should be a simple mapping between those high-level representations and um, sentences, words, and so on. Uh, not necessarily a one-to-one -one thing, but uh, something fairly straightforward. Um, again, I mean, the, the psychological uh, evidence for this is everything you do consciously, you can report verbally. Um, it, it's not... It, it, it's not always easy to explain everything that you're thinking about verbally, but at least you can describe it pretty well. Uh, like if you have mental images, sometimes it's not completely easy, but, but at least you have words for it. So there is, there is a mapping and it goes both ways, right? So if I say something, which is what I'm doing right now, it creates a mental picture in your brain. This is why I'm giving a talk. Ooh, spooky. I'm influencing all your brains, right? So the mapping goes both ways. I mean, that's how we learn uh, from others who are speaking. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, 
to dominate the world or something. Um, so, so yeah, so this, this is something we should put in our architectures. This is something we should put in our experiments uh, because language is containing very strong clues about what the high level semantic variables should be. Next one. Next one is, is something that is straight off from good old fashioned AI and programming. Uh, the pieces of knowledge that we manipulate at a conscious level are sort of reusable over many possible instances or arguments, right? If I know um, that dogs often have a tail, I can use that knowledge on any dog, right? It's like, you know, in a classical AI, you have these rules with variables or in programming, you have functions with arguments and you can stick in any argument you want and the function maintains its integrity. Whereas if you think about a normal neural net, you have like a multi-layer net or recurrent net, you have these units, right? They compute a value based on the input weights into those units. So the values are tied to the weights. You can't easily separate the two things and say, I'm gonna use those weights on different values. I mean, you can at the level of the global system because you could say, well, I'm gonna use my brain on different problems. But inside your brain, if you were to like modularize the computation, the, you know, where the input comes from is always sort of fixed in a standard architecture. But if you use attention, it changes the game, right? Because I can select where a particular module takes its inputs. So it's like a function in programming where I have the code, but I can provide with my attention mechanism different arguments, and then it's gonna apply the same computation on different inputs. So, so attention really unlocks this possibility of having indirection and defining a kind of generic processing or rules or not pieces of knowledge that can be applied to uh, a, a different arguments. And so we have placeholders for these arguments, which you can think of right variables, right? Um, Another, another inductive bias, which maybe is less obvious and that, you know, I'm not as sure about it, but it, but it seems plausible. Um, well, actually there is some, some neuroscientific evidence for this. Uh, the, the encoder that maps low level stuff to high level stuff is stable. Uh, stable means it's not something that changes every day. It's something if, if from a machine learning perspective, it would be something you would converge to, even though the world is non-stationary. Um, we sort of converge to this mapping, right? It, 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 uh, I mean, we can add new variables, but, and, and we can tweak them. It's not that we're not learning them, but it's not like, um, uh, other aspects of the world, which may change from a week to the next week um, as a result of the intervention of uh, some agent, for example. So meaning is something that's fairly stable and robust to changes in distribution. And uh, one uh, neuroscience sort of uh, fact that supports this is uh, the lower levels of your visual system um, they don't like to change <laughs> because the low level features should be stable properties. And so if we give you these weird glasses that turn the world upside down or stuff like that, it takes you a long time to adapt. Whereas high level features, like if, if I give you um, dark uh, glasses, you can instantaneously adapt to that because you don't need to change your low level features. You can just change some high level thing um, that, that says, oh, I'm, I'm wearing dark glasses. So things are gonna be dark and otherwise I can do as usual. 
uh, I can I can I can factor that in whatever uh, I interpret, and I don't need to change the whole visual processing pathway for adapting to this. So there are things we can adapt to quickly, and uh, they seem to be high level stuff that we can verbalize. Like I have dark glasses on, but uh, things that in order to adapt to some things would require like really changing the low level features and the encoder. They, your brain seems to be very resistant to that, right? So there's a prior probably there. And the last one I wanna mention is connected to what I said about memory and, um, and self-attention to look back into the things we've done before. Um, one of the things that we are investigating is how this self-attention uh, ability, like basically looking back into you, your past memories, um, can be used to perform credit assignment. So, you know, we do this consciously often, like, you know, you, you did something wrong and then you realized later, and then the memory of when you did it comes back to you and probably you, there's something that changes in your brain so that you wouldn't do it again, or you, you would be less likely to do it again. So uh, that ability to do memory access in order to do credit assignment uh, can work if you don't need to recover from memory a thousand things, but if you only are, you know, if, if it's sufficient to recover like one, two, three, four things. And those things, if it's more than one, uh, maybe it was a chain of things that you did, which led to this mishap. And you realize that there is this causal structure and now you can do counterfactuals. Like if I had acted differently, what would have happened? This is all happening in your brain and it, it's happening in a conscious way. Um, and, um, and so, it, but it only works well if the sort of causal dependencies that your conscious part of the brain is handling are involve very short causal chains. Right? And again, this is an uh, this is an assumption about uh, at least some aspects of the world, but not necessarily uh, everything. And and again, you can you can prove this by considering how we explain things you know that have happened in the past and explain as a causal chain. We, we make up a story. The story is not like a thousand books. The, the story is a, a few sentences, right? So again, that, that's, a, that's sort of a illustration that the verbalizable knowledge seems to embody this kind of assumption about the causal structure in this case. Okay, maybe I should make a pause here in case people have questions. Um, yes, Sergey, do you have a question, right? You can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, are you talking about me? Yes. Uh, sorry, I think I just pressed the button. Sorry. That's all right, I can continue. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper in some of these things. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time, but, but you know, it's sometimes good to revise these things. So, so here's an example of the sparse factor graph assumption. Uh, I say a sentence like, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. Uh, clearly, I can make a very strong prediction on like the position of the ball based on what? Like two, three variables. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, you had it in your hand. You drop it. There's a ground. Yeah, it's going to end up on the ground. Um. So, so this is surprising, right? I mean, we're used to this, so we don't think about it. But um, think of it making about think of about making a prediction about a pixel in an image given four other pixels. How good do you think your prediction is going to be? Pretty bad. Try it. I mean, we've tried it, right? Like we've tried to train, train, train uh, Confnet to predict the next pixel given four pixels, and, and that doesn't work very well. You you have to enlarge the context to include a lot, pretty much everything 
before in, in some sequence order of visiting the pixels to get good probabilistic models of images. So in general, for the low level data, this assumption is not true. So this is an illustration of you know, the separation between system one and system two, that um, the, you have to transform the representation of the world into that high level representation space to achieve this property of a sparse factor graph. It is not a natural property that you get for free in general. It is a property that is true only when we map the data to that space. And when we map it there, we might lose some information. We might lose some details. So you still need system one to, to carry the parts that are not verbalizable. You no, know, uh, uh, how is it like a picture is, is worth a thousand words, right? Uh, there's a lot of details that are hard to, I mean, that you can always verbalize every pixel. I can describe the sequence of pixels, but but it's not a, language isn't meant to describe all of the details uh, that you have in an image, but it describes the sort of things that matter for uh, human planning, understanding, socializing, and so on. All right, so, so this property, um, so uh, in terms of graphical models, so there's a picture on the bottom right where you see an example of a factor graph. You have two kinds of nodes. The circles here are the variables and the squares are the factors. So the joint distribution can be written as a product of potential functions. Each potential function takes as argument the values of the variables attached to the factor. And that's it, that's the joint. Then you have a normalizing constant, that's a factor graph. So every Joint distribution can be written as a factor graph. It's just a particular formalism, but it's just one that in which, uh, you know, talking about sparsity um, seems to be appropriate. Uh, probably you could, you could express it in different ways, but I, I like this one. Right. Um, and now I want to make a comment about disentangling because I, I started using this word in the late, I mean, uh, the, the end of the teens, the teens of this century. And what I had in mind was not that disentangling meant that the high level variables needed to be independent, but this is how it's been understood. And, and there's a lot of work and workshops about disentangling factors of variation where most of the work like these beta VAEs and stuff uh, or generally VAEs are uh, variational autoencoders um, based on the assumption that the top level representation have has this these uh, these independent variables, the marginally independent. Meaning, when you generate from the model, you first sample these factors independently, these variables independently from each other. Now the word factor is meaning variables uh, independently of each other, and then you 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 map that to the low level variables. Um, that is not a good depiction. It doesn't work for semantic variables. They are not marginally independent. Like knife and fork are not independent. They often come together in the same sentence. So we need to have at the highest level, a, um, a joint distribution that captures that structure and, and not have independent variables. Of course, you can turn any joint distribution into a set of independent variables. Like, you can express the uh, the conditionals, for example, using a, a, a structural causal model uh, in terms of independent noise variables. But these independent noise variables, they don't have the kind of semantics as the semantic variables, which we use with language and stuff. And so we really have to understand the distinction between, yeah, of course you can draw some Gaussian variables and do stuff with them and you can construct any distribution. But these Gaussian variables are not the kind of high level variables we really want our neural nets to discover and manipulate. All right, so that's, that's a little message. Um, now this uh, sparse factor graph assumption is, is a sort of declarative knowledge assumption, right? Here's how the joint is structured. It doesn't really directly tell us something about the kind of neural net architecture which we should build that exploits this assumption. It's not clear how you turn that into inference mechanisms that, that exploit this assumption. And one, I mean, one possibility 
that makes a lot of sense is that the inference mechanism used in the brain for that joint distribution is a sequential one. It's, it's one where you visit the graph going from one factor, like one group of dependencies to another that's neighboring in the graph. And, 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 and our trains of thought seem to be like this, like there's this associative kind of effect. Um, and there are inference algorithms for graphical models that have that kind of nature where you sequentially visit nodes uh, in order to do what? In order to try to give them values that are gonna be mutually coherent with the joint distribution, right? We're trying to find, what is inference? You're trying to find a setting of some variables which is consistent with some of the things we have observed. This is what inference is about, right? Like I know some things, what does it mean for other things? Um, and if you look at what your conscious thoughts are about and the theories about conscious processing, they seem to be a lot about that as well. Like this communication between modules is to make the different modules choose uh, interpretations of the variables they are uh, responsible of that are consistent with this global picture. And so uh, it seems that we sequentially like fix things that are incoherent. So conscious processing is a lot about making up a conscious, inf uh, I mean, a, a coherent inference about the world and, and the way that our brain seems to do it is sequentially by visiting those factors and, 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 and variables corresponding to different pieces of knowledge one at a time. And so the attention mechanism comes in there, right? If you're gonna do this inference sequentially, then you need a tool to decide what's gonna be the next uh, factor that you're gonna be focusing on. And that's where attention comes up. Attention and memory, right? Because in a way, the memory system is part of this, right? So the memory system holds all the pieces of knowledge. And when you retrieve something from memory, it's like, oh, I'm gonna focus on that piece of knowledge to make sure that my interpretation is gonna be coherent with that piece of knowledge. All right, now let's talk about the, the causality stuff. Uh, so the, the, one of the dreams of the early work on deep learning was that we would build these uh, machines that take raw like pixels and map them to high level representations, abstract representations that capture um, what I would now call like semantic variables and, and, and causal explanations and stuff. Uh, and so uh, when you ask what would be the right representations at the top of these neural nets, um, a very nice answer that at least I would like to see and that we've had in mind for uh, a couple of decades is that, well, they would be essentially causal variables explaining the observed input data. Um, and so this of course raises the question of how are we gonna discover those variables? Like we're not, usually we don't get labels for them. I mean, sometimes we do, but we don't necessarily get uh, all of that. And we also need to figure out uh, how these variables are related to each other. What kind of dependencies, what kind of causal structure um, um, they, they uh, exist between them. And also we need to learn how interventions work, right? So we need to learn how that uh, graph is going to be manipulated, how its values can change as a consequence of actions because we are agents, we are acting in the world. It's a huge part of our knowledge. As I said, in language, it's all about, when I say it's all about causality, you gotta equally say it's all about agents acting in the world in order to achieve something, right? Um, okay, so, so that's a big order, but that I think we need to do more machine learning aiming uh, to learn both this encoder decoder that maps low level stuff to high level stuff and vice versa, and how the high level stuff is structured causally. Okay, now let's talk about the changes in distribution. So, uh, I talked a little bit about it earlier. Let's, let's try to go a little bit more detail. Um, so um, earlier I said that pixel space would not be a good place 
um, to satisfy the sparse factor graph assumption. And pixel space is also not a good place to satisfy the localized change in distribution assumption. In other words, when something changes in the world, um, let me see what's the next picture. No, sorry. When, uh, oh, sorry. When something changes in the world, like I put on my dark glasses, uh, many pixels can change. So pixel space doesn't satisfy that assumption that changes are localized. But in the semantic space, it works. I put on my dark glasses, there's this one variable that says Joshua has dark glasses and it flips from off to on, okay? So this is a constraint um, which is not true for pixels, but would be true for the right space. And so we can exploit that, right? If we're gonna, if we want to discover a good space of representation, in addition to, I mean, all of the things I've been talking about, they put constraints on what this uh, semantic space should look like. Uh, but in particular, this one is interesting because it tells us about um, changes in distribution. We know this is one of the weaknesses of current machine learning. So if we can, if we can use this uh, prior to lead to systems that adapt faster or better or out of distribution, that would be great. So we explored this um, in several papers. Um, I think there's three papers right now. Um, one has been published at iClear this year. Uh, after being rejected from Europe's, uh, of course. And um, the um, other is an archive and is submitted. And there's a third one that is also submitted. Um, so, so the first paper looked at um, the case where you just have two causal variables. It's called them A and B. And you're trying to figure out whether A causes B or B causes A. It seems like a very easy problem. Actually, it isn't. And there's a lot of uh, literature in um, causal discovery to try to address this even very simple case. Um, and uh, what we are doing in this paper is we are going to assume that somebody tells us there's been a change in distribution between the joint of A and B, but the person doesn't tell us what the change was, uh, which variable was modified. Uh, so we're gonna assume that the change is localized, right? We're gonna assume that the, the, the prior, the inductive bias is, is, is good. Um, and um, well, actually it could be good for the A, B level, but then we, one variant of the experiments, we have actually X and Y being the observed variables and the locality of change is true for the AB space, but it's not true for the XY space. And so this will force, the, 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 this inductive bias will force the discovery of AB up to permutation, other uh, rotations. Uh, uh, it will force the discovery of AB uh, and the causal structure between AB given only observations of X and Y. And what we see in the figure here to illustrate what is going on is that uh, we have these two curves on the x-axis is the number of examples uh, in the new distribution. So it's a small number, right, like 20. And on the y-axis is the uh, a kind of uh, online log likelihood, how well you're doing uh, given that many examples on the new distribution. So if you were to measure on a test set, a big test set, how good your model is as you see a few new examples. Uh, what you find is that the, the model that embodies the correct causal structure, and in fact, also the co correct mapping between the X, Y, and AB learns a lot faster, right? So it converges to um, the asymptotic answer very quickly, whereas the, the model that doesn't have the right causal structure uh, takes a lot more time. So there are a number of lessons from this. Uh, one of them is asymptotically, like when you have a change in distribution, if you wait long enough to have enough examples of the new distribution, then every method works and you don't have any signal to tell you about, for example, the causal structure or what is a good space of representation. But if you look at the early 
uh, early stages when you only have like a handful of examples, this is where there is the biggest disparity between the good models that have the right causal structure and the right causal variables and the bad models, which don't. And so that is saying something about how we should do our machine learning experiments. Like we should stop doing purely IAD, you know, experiments. We should like build experimental setups where the distribution keeps changing and it keeps changing often. Like you see 10 examples, bang, some, you know, something happens, distribution changed. What's interesting is that the way we, we did it in this paper didn't require to know what the intervention was. In, in, in many, uh, in much of the literature on, on causality, first of all, people assume that we know what the causal variables are, we directly observe them. And second, we assume that we know what the intervention, you know, we're doing an intervention, like people do a scientific experiment, you know what you're doing. And so it makes sense. But if you, if you look at the perspective of a learning agent, like a, a baby or a robot, you don't know what the intervention is, right? You just, you know, just observe the raw sensory signal and something has changed. You don't even know that something has changed. You just get like observations. Um, and so you'd like to have methods that can work in this setting where we can have robots or babies gradually build a causal model of the world. Um, all right, uh, without, without having to know what the right variable space is and who did exactly what. Um, there's a follow-up work with a couple of papers um, in which we extend this same line of thinking to larger graphs. Um, and I mean, some of the technical contributions here is now, you know, in, in, in this thing, I enumerated all the causal models. If you only have two, you can just try both of them and see which one works. And that's pretty easy. But if you, if you have many variables, uh, then there's an exponential or super exponential number of possible graphs. And, uh, and so you can't enumerate all of them. So, so, uh, so what we do is we maintain a belief distribution over graphs. And to make it convenient, that belief distribution is factorized. So basically we just maintain a probability for each edge, each directed edge to be present or not. So it's like we have a matrix. If we have n variables, we have a n squared entries. Uh, I mean, except no diagonal, and we update those probabilities of um, variable Asia being a parent of variable tub for every pair of variables. And the way we are learning this uh, again by observing changes in distribution, and then at each. Uh, for each change in distribution, we sample from our belief distribution uh, a bunch of candidate graphs. And then basically we have a way to measure how well uh, these different hypotheses are consistent with what we are observing. And those that are more consistent get a boost in their probability and, and, and those that are less consistent get a decrease in their probability and that's it, right? I mean, there's more math behind it, but that's roughly how it works. And it, it, it it worked pretty well and we are able to learn, uh, you know, to go from graphs of two variables to graphs of tens of variables. Um, it's still not clear how we can extend that to like millions of variables or even hundreds, I think hundreds would be feasible, but we probably need different methods to scale beyond that. Um, another interesting part of this work is that in order to make this work, uh, we need to, include as part of the machinery that does the, the, the discovery of the graph, uh, a piece that does inference over the intervention. In other words, the neural net, well, this is all full of neural nets, each conditional is a neural net. So, but the, the, by observing how the, the, the different neural nets are behaving, we make a guess, a prediction if you want, about what was the variable which received the intervention. And that helps a lot to converge faster. Um, system one and system two. So up to now, the way that I've been speaking about system two may have sounded like, oh, once we've mapped 
the raw data to the semantic variables, we can just do our system two stuff. But that is not a good way of thinking about it. Uh, there are many aspects of system two processing which cannot work without the underlying system one um, framed, framework. Um, so, so one obvious place is semantics, right? So uh, the, there is, I mean, one of the reasons why uh, classical AI had trouble in uh, natural language understanding is because it's very hard to express with rules and, and symbols and, and sort of system two representations. It's very hard to express some aspects of the meaning. Think about intuitive physics, right? Um, but we need that understanding which re resides in system one in order to make sense of natural language sentences. And so really we have to build systems which incorporate both of them. We can't do natural language learning based purely on texts. I think this is not ever gonna work. It's a prediction. I mean, uh, you need somehow the language learner to see here, have sensory perception and build both a system one and system two understanding of the world. And this is also consistent with what I said at the beginning, right? That the uh, uh, system two is capturing some aspects of knowledge and system one is capturing other aspects. And if you only have one part, you don't have a full picture, right? Um, all right, so we need to do grounded language learning and uh, there's some work in that direction, but we need a lot more. Um, so let's talk about inference. So the, the previous work on the, these causal neural nets, they, um, they were really learning the declarative part of the system two knowledge. But well, what about how we actually like uh, make predictions about the future, solve problems, like basically do inference? Uh, how do we, how do we turn the uh, sparse fact graph assumption and, and the global working, the global workspace theory into neural net architectures that are doing things that are allowing us to act and, and predict and so on, and, and not just represent the declarative knowledge. So we've explored different kinds of recurrent net architectures that do that. Um, so first of all, they're modular. Each module is capturing like a different piece of knowledge. Each module, if each module is fully connected inside the module, but but very sparsely connected with the others, and it's it's connected in a dynamic, attention-driven way, so that um, it's attention mechanisms which decide uh, what are the messages that are being exchanged. Furthermore, in a more recent version, uh, we actually use a working memory through which they communicate, just like in the global workspace theory. And what we find with these kinds of architectures is that they, even though they, they're not trained with some sort of meta-learning scheme to, to make out of distribution uh, generalization work well, they, they seem to naturally perform better out of distribution generalization than other uh, like standard art alternatives based on recurrent nets or transformers or something like this. Uh, so there's a version that uses the, uh, a, a, as an intermediate communication device, this uh, global workspace, which is just a, a memory with key keys and values and that seems to help. Um, there is a variant where uh, we, we uh, apply this uh, assumption I talked about where we separate the values which go into the working memory basically from the, the parameters that control the, the knowledge, right? Which we call schema here. Um, so the same schema, so for example, if you have uh, the Pac-Man here, the same schema could be applied to different characters in the game. Um, and the same character at different times, maybe in different states, uh, and in these different states, maybe different schemas might be applied. So we want to separate the objects that are being manipulated from the functions that operate on them. So it's a, it's, a, it's a modification of the architecture that again uses attention, but now it's double attention, right? Now we have to choose 
like which object is going to go with which schema. And again, um, there's competition between them in order to achieve that. Uh, yeah. Um, there's another piece of work uh, I want to mention where we combine the RIMS with meta learning. Meta learning uh, allows us to explicitly train so that you're going to get better out of distribution generalization, and, and that helps. And I guess I've arrived at the end of my presentation. I just want to show this little um, graph of concepts, which uh, hopefully uh, my lecture today has um, allowed you to see the connections between uh, many of these concepts but that may otherwise look like unrelated. So for example, uh, I've talked about causality. Causality is uh, really connected to out of distribution generalization. It's connected to agency. It's connected to uh, systematic generalization. Uh, it's connected to modularity and compositionality. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, these concepts are connected to system two aspects in, in, uh, in human uh, systems, consciousness, reasoning, language, attention, and so on. Um, there's a lot of interesting links between uh, these different aspects. So thanks very much. And oh, shot, I forgot, we have a responsibility. Um, AI is uh, dangerous and uh, we have to build a world in which um, power is not too concentrated and everybody's well treated. Otherwise, it's like we're going to eventually give nuclear bombs to every child on the planet. And that's going to be a recipe for disaster. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joshua. It was a very nice lecture. Um, so I think um, we should maybe move the questions for the round table. Um, yes. For the, for the other events. Um, yeah, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. See you later. Thank you. Bye bye.